Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm so excited um, uh, that you're all here, and I'm excited uh, for our speaker, and, and I'm just kind of excited um, in general. I'm Jeff Grossman. I'm the department head of the material science and engineering department here at MIT. Um, and, um, and today, we have our Wolf Lecture. Um, and so before I introduce our, our, our Wolf Lecture for uh, the spring and our, our speaker for the day, um, I wanted just to give you the background of like, well, what is the Wolf Lecture, right? Like, who, who, who's, what, is it a who? Oh yeah, John Wolf. Um, so it's a who, that gave that away. But here he is. And, um, and John Wolf was a professor here um, and a very, uh, very skilled educator. Um, and, and actually, he's, how many of you uh, have taken 3091? How many, of, oh, sweet. How many of you are in 3091 right now? Huh? How, <laughs> any freshmen in the audience? Freshmen? Yeah, cool. Awesome. Um, welcome. Um, well, that's the thing is he loved teaching freshmen. He really did, and he loved teaching undergrads. And he developed, he was the first instructor, the creator of, of uh, the course 3091, and he was a really passionate teacher. And, and he had this ability, um, and there he is in action, right? And I look at that, and that's just, I'm inspired by that picture. Um, and he had this ability to both, you know, inspire and entertain and teach all at the same time. And he was, he was, uh, he was really quite a force. Um, so we, we created this lectureship um, to kind of continue bringing people in um, who, who can do that in our discipline, who can continue carrying on this tradition uh, in our, no, no pressure, Billy. Yeah. <laughs> and so that gets me to the one last thing I'll say for just a minute, which is what is our discipline? Well, for those of you who don't know, we are architects of matter. We build solid matter. And we do this um, while thinking about sort of all of the things shown on the right. So we think about sort of what the, you know, what the, how do you process the matter? Well, we use all the tools available right, from different disciplines. Um, we think about what structure and properties the matter will take, right? And, and we use different tools to make those structures, to characterize them, and then uh, to, to make them have the properties that we want. And then we think about um, the ways in which that matter is important to society. And this is a real moment in the world because, because so many of the challenges that we face in the world are actually bottlenecked by the choice or the need for a different type of matter, a different material, right? And so the fact that we can now go from atom to planet and do that at scale with manufacturing, with, with cost, right, um, is something that is very exciting, that convergence of our discipline with the challenges that the planet faces. Um, and so, so with that, so that's kind of how we think in our department. And with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker, um, Dr. Uh, Billy Wood, what, can I call you Billy? Yeah. Billy Woodford, William Woodford. Thank you. I've always called you Billy. Um, <laughs> and I know Billy. Why do I know Billy? Because he was a PhD student here. Um, um, and, you know, kind of one of those students where it's like, oh, yeah, this is why I'm at MIT. <laughs> right? It's, it's, um, and so, um, and he did his undergraduate at Penn State uh, University. And by the way, you're, we're all students like that, but working with them is like, anyway. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so he got his PhD. So he won the TR35 uh, award, uh, which means he's won he was, uh, as Technology Reviews uh, uh, identified him as one of the world's top 35 innovators under the age of 35. So that's quite a, a, a title. After here, he went to 24M, where he was director of uh, advanced R&D, and and since and then he left there to become the CTO of Form Energy. And his career is really focused on uh, developing robust and low-cost uh, storage systems based on electrochemical platforms, uh, both here in academia and then also at these startups. So uh, please join me in giving a big round of applause for welcoming Billy Woodford. We got to flip the projector back over. Thank you, Jeff, for the very kind introduction, and uh, and and to everybody for the lovely day, and, and Nina especially for uh, all, where I we're back there. Oh, is my mic on? No slides. All right, we're good. Uh, thank you for organizing a lovely day. It was really wonderful to reconnect uh, and to see uh, many ways in which the department uh, is the same and many ways in which the department uh, has grown and, and has improved. Uh, so it was a lot of fun. Um, 
uh, at the outset while we're figuring this out. Uh, and, uh, the talk I wanted to give today was really a lot about uh, the why. Uh, wh why are we working on multi-day storage at Forum Energy? Um, and a little bit about the journey. Uh, I don't have, this is not a detailed technical presentation digging into all the electrochemical nuts and bolts of how an iron air battery works and why. There will be a little bit of that, um, but much more of um, why are we doing this? Um, and how does it connect to a broader need to decarbonize? Um, and what are some of the ways that iron air batteries as a technology and as a platform intersect, uh, especially with steel making um, and decarbonizing some of these really difficult to decarbonize industries like steel making? Um, that just as a society, we absolutely have to decarbonize. And uh, material science solutions, material science innovation uh, is uh, going to be central to our ability to do that. And so I don't think it's necessary anymore to give a really detailed, uh, elaborate windup of the motivation of uh, why climate change is an important problem to work on. Um, uh, it's pretty obvious. Uh, we got some work to do, and we're behind. Um, and uh, the problem that Form Energy uh, is tackling is really around this sector. So if this is all of uh, global uh, CO2 emissions sources, uh, direct electricity generation represents about a quarter of that, maybe a quarter to a third. Um, and this piece is really what we're going after. How can you truly decarbonize um, uh, the electricity generation sector uh, while maintaining reliability and affordability? So those two caveats are really important pieces of uh, what we're trying to do. Um, this is one way of visualizing that gap, um, that need. So this is a picture of the blend of energy generation resources uh, in the United States. I'll show the global view in a bit. Uh, over time, and this is a projection, there's a crystal ball here, right? So this is not going to be perfectly accurate, but in broad brushstrokes, as a business as usual scenario, this is what that would look like. Um, and what you can see is that uh, between 2020 and 2050, we are gonna deploy a lot of renewables. We're gonna push out a lot of wind and solar. Uh, but without new solutions, new technology solutions, um, we're gonna be relying on uh, a lot of uh, fossil fuels, and we can't do that. And so this is one way of visualizing the gap. Without firm renewables, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means, we're gonna really struggle to retire all of those fossil assets. And so that's, that's the motivation for what we're up to at Form Energy. Uh, this is the global picture of that, and, and really this doesn't uh, resolve it nearly as much by time, but what does it say is the US picture of that, if you think about the need, is only about a tenth of the global need. And so you think about the scale of the problem, uh, it is a massive scale. We have to deploy a huge amount of renewables and a huge amount of new technologies in order to firm those up and to make them available, dispatchable all year round. Um, one piece of good news is that we have the generation technologies that we need. We have the generation uh, technologies. They've already come down the cost curve. And if you look at what wind and solar have done, and um, this picture is remarkably different from when I was a graduate student. When I was a graduate student, you know, that was back here in 2008 to 2012, 2013, we were coming down these cost curves. Today, um, they are way below uh, where, uh, say, like coal is today. Um, and the real comparisons are, are coal and natural gas. So natural gas has come down in cost, and that's driving a lot of retirement of coal. But wind and solar, um, those are also below the cost of natural gas. Um, the issue is the reliability, um, that wind doesn't blow all the time and the sun doesn't shine all the time. And that happens on multiple different length scales, or multiple different time scales, I should say. Um, so you'll know that because like a cloud will pass over the sun and it goes cloudy for a little bit. Um, but we also have these things called seasons, um, when my days are much shorter or longer. And so uh, there are a wide range of different time scales that have to be addressed in this solution. But that's the piece that remains to be solved in terms of actually uh, displacing all the coal and natural gas. And, and this stuff that I'm uh, citing here, the data source, and this is the statement that went along with this report. This is uh, Lazard. They're a, um, uh, a utility industry benchmarking agency, effectively. Um, and they look at the cost, the levelized cost of electricity, that's what this metric is here, of different generation sources. And there's lots of other stuff that goes into their report. And I just pulled out um, these couple of different generation technologies. Um, but this is the commentary that goes along with these data sets, is that today, wind and solar are lower cost in most geographies than coal and natural gas. But what has to be done is to make these things uh, the dispatch characteristics. That's the sort of coded language of the industry that says reliability, that I can turn these things on and off when I want to. Um, there are other motivations or other ways of visualizing these problems. Um, 
One example are extreme weather events. And so this is a weather event from 2021 um, in the Texas grid. Um, this actually was a polar vortex event. Um, this was in the news quite a lot. And there was a, a several day period where 30 gigawatts of generation capacity went offline. So 30 gigawatts, what does that mean? That's a huge fraction of the total electricity generating capacity in the state of Texas just disappeared because of a weather event. And so this is uh, plotted on uh, uh, the, uh, let's see, the, the dashed line is what was predicted, what the, uh, the grid operator was planning for, what they expected that they would have available to them. And the green line is what they actually had available to them. So this is over several days, you know, heading into Monday. They thought they were going to have this, and what they actually had was that. And so that 30, 30 gigawatt gap represented almost half of the generating capacity that they expected to have. And that lasted for several days. And um, one way of thinking about this is, uh, if you had a multi-day battery that could bridge that gap, uh, you could have ridden out a little bit of the storm. Um, and then the next question is, uh, well, could that actually have been cost effective? And given the dynamics of the market in Texas, just this one event could have paid for $10 a kilowatt hour of energy storage capex. And I'll, I'll come back to what that number means and uh, how to calibrate that. That turns out to be about half of the total cost target that you have to be at. And so in just a, a one week period, you could have paid back uh, almost half of the cost of such a system. Um, there's some other data sets in here, other pieces of the details, but that's really the, the key point of the story is, uh, if there was a, a multi-day storage solution that existed at scale today, uh, this kind of event could have been a, uh, ridden out with a very different set of human consequences, right? So people were uh, freezing in their homes. There were a lot of uh, broken water pipes. So just huge human impact from these weather events. Um, there's another um, sort of set of examples that I've got of how are um, the impacts of the time scales in renewables showing up in the grid system even today. And um, this other set of example is much more to do with this seasonality pattern. Um, and uh, so we all know that, that you know, the solar irradiation is seasonal. And this is one way of picturing solar irradiation. So red is uh, where the solar, sun is shining brighter um, as a function of geography in the United States. And these are data sets that uh, NREL, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Colorado, um, uh, sort of tabulates and publishes. Uh, folks who are out developing solar projects will rely on these to help pick where are the good sites, where should I put my solar panels uh, to generate electricity at lowest cost. And if you look at the picture uh, in July, it's a very different picture, right? So the sun is shining very differently uh, in the summer than in the winter. Well, what does that mean? Is that actually showing up anywhere as we're putting solar into the grid? Does this matter or not? Um, one example of a case study where this does matter is in California. And uh, in California, uh, the system operator, the folks who run the grid in California, is the California ISO, the California Independent System Operator. They're responsible for planning and scheduling uh, which assets can charge and discharge when, who's producing power, um, and they orchestrate all of that through a series of uh, contracts and auctions. And uh, they actually have what they call an oversupply problem. You can go to their website, and you can find the data that I've plotted here, that managing oversupply. So the California grid uh, is, a, uh, it is a, a, a winter peaking grid. That means that they have the most demand then. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, it's a summer peaking grid. I, Misspoke. So it's a summer peaking grid. They have the most demand in the summer. Um, and so uh, what we're going to see here, as I played this out, is that there are shoulder seasons where there's an oversupply of renewables. When the uh, air conditioners don't need to be turned on, uh, but you still have a decent amount of distribution of that solar from July, um, we're going to see excess renewables showing up into the grid system. And what this is a measure of is the amount of renewables, or the amount of electricity, that the system operator is curtailing, which means telling people not to generate. It's being generated, and they're saying, disconnect or run through a load bag, but don't put that electricity onto my grid. Um, and this is, this is coming from renewables. And so as we go year by year, so this is how much curtailment there is per month, you just watch these curves grow up. And, and I'll also remind you, this picture, 2017, this is when we, we started at Form Energy. And we were doing uh, a lot of analysis around this data set to say, this trend is going to play out. Um, and it just has uh, continued to go way up and to the right in terms of the amount of oversupply that exists. Um, I put the 2023 data on. They publish it every month. They put a new data point. So I'm going to have to, through the rest of this year, play this one out. But you can see year by year, you know, there's a little bit of variation in here. It's a monthly data set. 
But sure enough, every sp spring, there's a peak. There's an oversupply. There's solar showing up into the system, but not enough demand for it. And so uh, one thing that long duration or multi-day energy storage can do is to help to arbitrage some of that energy, to shift it from one season into another. And then when you have this crunch in the summer, to take some amount of this oversupply and to keep it around for reliability purposes, to keep a reserve on the system. So this is a lot about the why. Um, in 2017, we started Form Energy uh, as a company to go after this problem. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about iron. We didn't start the company as an iron air battery company. We started it as a company uh, to go after the problem of multi-day storage. And everything that I just gave to you is motivation of the problem, why we're going to go do this and why we think there's an opportunity to create a business around it. Um, today, uh, we are over 400, we're actually almost 450 employees uh, across uh, three different principal geographies, four different sites. So we started here in the Boston area. We have uh, lab space out in Somerville near the Market Basket. Uh, and uh, we have additional sites uh, in uh, the Bay Area in California, um, outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, and we just announced uh, our first full-scale manufacturing facility will be in Weirton, West Virginia. I'll talk more about Weirton uh, later in the talk. But uh, that'll be our next, that's our latest site. Our, and it'll be the biggest by far uh, when we open that up. Um, uh, of those 400 employees, we actually employ a lot of material scientists, and I, I'm just so thrilled to see. We have a number of form alums who are uh, in the audience here and in, in some current employees, so thank you all for coming out and for uh, having had the opportunity to work with you. Uh, uh, it's been great. It's a real team effort. Um, and certainly uh, one of the things that's different about working in a startup is uh, that it is a team sport in a way that uh, uh, doing a PhD is not, and, uh, and that's been really, really enjoyable. Um, these are some fixtures of it is a team effort, and I really have to thank the team at Form Energy. So everything I'm going to show you uh, is a result of huge contributions from many different folks. Um, I'll try and acknowledge folks uh, sort of when and where we can here. Uh, uh, since I'm not showing a lot of data, there's not a lot uh, of individual attribution. So it's, it is a team effort, and it's taken uh, contributions from all these folks. So it's, it's a joy to work with them, and I want to thank them very specifically. Um, so the problem that we're after, again, is a simple equation. I have wind and solar generation technology, and I want to add a battery to that and have it be lower cost than natural gas. So coal was already higher cost than natural gas, so uh, the coal is going to go away. And the real bogey is natural gas. So how do I make this be true? And this is some algebra. How do I solve for the cost of storage that must exist in order to make this equation just be true and make it be not just uh, folks decarbonizing out of the goodness of their heart, but folks decarbonizing because it just makes good business sense and it's the cheaper thing to do. And uh, what we found is that uh, the kind of battery that you'll need to do that is something that costs uh, about uh, 10 to 100 times less than a lithium ion battery does today. And when I talk about a lithium ion battery, I'm not talking about the cost of a cell, you know, a, uh, a cylindrical cell or a prismatic cell, whatever lithium ion cell you'd like to, to talk about. What I'm talking about is a lithium ion power plant, a system that is connected to the grid uh, with a transformer, landed on a concrete slab that's deployed uh, uh, on the grid, uh, fully integrated system, landed, installed cost. Today, that's somewhere around, mm, around $200 a kilowatt hour is the number that you should have in mind. That's maybe gone up a little bit over the last year or two because of um, some supply crunch on uh, just lithium availability. But longer term, that's going to go away. Uh, that, that'll come back down uh, probably close to $100 a kilowatt hour. So those are two key, actually, it was maybe closer to 300 in 2017 when we made this slide. Um, and this plot is installed cost on a log scale, that metric I just talked about, as a function of duration on a log scale. And lithium ions one bogey. The other bogey is pumped hydro. And what that means is uh, water that is a low-lying reservoir and a high-lying, basically, giant swimming pool. Um, and uh, this is actually the most widely deployed energy storage technology on the planet today. Um, it is actually a great technology. It works phenomenally well. It's reliable, high round trip efficiency. The problem is we can't build nearly enough of it because there's not enough sites. Um, and so we need new technologies. But it's a great bogey. It's an existence proof of what it will take for the right kind of storage. And those are these purple points. And so there's a number of different installations. These are US installations. 
Um, and you can see there are a couple ones. These are actually Western deployments where there are very large geologic features, very large lakes and reservoirs um, that we can use to pump up and down. And so even there's some things in this multi-day storage range as pumped hydro, we just we can't build more of it. And so this orange blob was uh, what we thought we would need to go after. Um, one other just note, I, I put everything in terms of dollars per kilowatt hour on here for consistency, and I don't want to have to swap back and forth between dollars per kilowatt hour and dollars per kilowatt, so dollars for energy and dollars per, per power, um, but they're just related to each other by division or multiplication. So my dollars per kilowatt hour number, if I multiply by duration, I'll get dollars per kilowatt. One thing that's universally true here is that uh, what a utility really wants to procure is a power asset. Uh, they'd like to buy something on a dollars per kilowatt basis. And so as I go to longer duration, my cost has to come down uh, so that I have a constant power cost. And roughly, a constant power cost that's tolerable is $2,000 a kilowatt. So at 100 hours, I need to be at or below $20 per kilowatt hour. So I'll use that as a benchmark threshold number for you a few times later in the talk. So I wanted to just point that out. How do you get to it? It's a very simple, uh, uh, little bit hand wavy argument, but it puts you in the right ballpark, and it, it's enough to motivate a lot of the, the remaining pieces here. That's also where I said that one Texas event, remember, that could pay for $10 a kilowatt hour. That's why I said it could pay for half of a 100-hour storage system just in that one vent alone. Um, so we set to work actually uh, thinking about what kind of battery chemistry could be useful for multi-day storage. And uh, we, didn't, we didn't start as an iron air battery company. I, I said that already. Um, we took a really broad view of what kind of storage solutions could be uh, deployed. We need to get below $20 a kilowatt hour. And we know we got to have low cost chemistry in order to do that. This is a plot uh, that is from uh, an MIT publication. This is from uh, Professor Chang's lab from the work of uh, postdoc Zhang Li and, and uh, uh, Liang Su was another postdoc working on this, on uh, aqueous sulfur battery chemistries. That was one of the ideas that we uh, strongly considered early on in, in Form Energy. And this is a survey of the chemical cost, not my fully installed battery system cost, but just my active materials. I took you know, the guts of my lithium ion battery in my cell phone, and I ripped them out of the battery, just the key active powders, and I put them on the table, and I paid only for those. That's the cost number that's on here for a lithium ion battery. And this is plotted on a log scale as a function of when that battery chemistry was first reported. And so a first thing is, generally, this plot is up and to the right. And it's up and to the right because we haven't been motivated to develop uh, large scale, extremely low cost energy storage systems. Energy storage systems have largely been motivated by mobility. So the fact that I'd like to drive an electric vehicle, I'd like to have a laptop, a cell phone, those have been the main motivation. And cost is important, but cost is not as critically important for those applications as it is for large scale, long duration, or multi-day energy storage, where that's, that's the only job. You know, I need my thing to sit there and store energy and to do it reliably and reversibly, not to move around. Um, and so energy density matters a little bit, but not so much. It's not a primary selection criteria. A uh, second thing is, if I look at $20 a kilowatt hour, um, and, that's, and there's a couple uh, historical data points, so lead acid, zinc air, nickel zinc, nickel cadmium, those are older. Those are sort of pre-World War II chemistries. Those fall off the left-hand side of the plot. At $20 a kilowatt hour, that's my, that's my budget for the whole system. There's almost nothing that falls below that line. Like almost all of these chemistries are above that line. So I can just rule those out immediately. But more importantly, what I talked about $20 a kilowatt hour is like the whole system landed and installed. I got to pay for a whole lot of other stuff. So I need some budget left over for all of that. And um, that's why it's so important to be near the bottom of this plot. So these chemistries that are sodium based, that are manganese based, that are iron based, uh, these uh, sulfur-based chemistries. Those are the kinds of things that can be in the hunt. They have, they're very abundant, they're generally pretty safe, uh, they have reasonable energy densities, and those are the candidates that we actually had to work from. Um, in terms of all the other costs, um, I don't want to go through all of this, but this is the point, is that chemistry cost is just the core of a full landed system cost. So I got to pay for a chemistry, then I got to put it inside of some sort of cell. I have to pay for current collectors. I have to get electrons in and out of all that stuff. I got to do that without overheating or uh, causing the thing to arc. I got to put all of that in some sort of tank, uh, whether that's a plastic container or a steel box, I got to pay for that. I got to pay for electronics. I have to uh, control each one of those cells. So there's just a lot of other costs that got to be accounted for, which is why you need that cost of chemistry to be Almost nothing, right? Almost none of my budget can go into paying for this. I got to pay for all of this other stuff. Um, and so it becomes a pretty 
thin set of pickings. And at the end of the day, we, we picked Iron Air uh, for a number of reasons, uh, but the cost of chemistry is a key reason. Um, it is, uh, to our knowledge, the lowest cost of rechargeable battery chemistry on the basis of a cost of chemistry. It also has a, a modest energy density. This is not world beating. This is not like a lithium ion cell. This is not, iron air shouldn't go in your electric vehicle. I'll just say that very directly. It's not for that. Um, uh, but it's, it's okay. So the cost of my tanks is manageable because it has a reasonable energy density. It's also uh, uh, a relatively safe chemistry. So I use an aqueous electrolyte. It's not flammable. Uh, the, the, the mechanics of the iron electrode uh, aren't prone to forming dendrites um, in the particular electrolyte solutions that we're using. We're using electrolyte solutions that are basic, not acidic. And so the iron uh, starts as a solid, stays as a solid as I go through a charge and discharge cycle. There's no stripping and plating that has to happen. And so stripping and plating is when you can tend to um, end up in a dangerous state with respect to dendrites that'll short circuit my battery. I mean, I, I connect the two terminals together, but inside the battery, uh, that tends to lead to very rapid discharge of the battery, overheating, and thermal events, fires. Um, and so the fact that I don't have dendrites uh, uh, at a chemistry level in an iron air battery is significant. It doesn't mean there aren't other safety challenges to be solved, but I'm starting from a place that is uh, more entitled to safety uh, than are, for example, a, a zinc or lithium metal based system. Um, there are other pieces, and I'll talk a lot about scale. Irons, there's lots of iron. There's a lot of iron resources all around the planet. Um, it's available on every continent except Antarctica. And so if you think about the global need for this, this is a technology that can be scaled and deployed all around the planet. And then there's also um, uh, some nice existence proof. So uh, iron air batteries are closely related to a battery chemistry called iron nickel that uses uh, not uh, air as the counter electrode, but a nickel electrode as the counter electrode. And those, were, those date back to Thomas Edison. So those were invented in 1901. And the iron electrode chemistry that's happening in an iron air battery is nearly identical to what happens in an iron nickel battery. And those are known to be very durable, thousands of cycles at 100% at full cycling of the battery, thousands of cycles. If I do partial cycling of the battery, I can do uh, up to tens of thousands of cycles on iron nickel batteries. So uh, those were all basic building blocks of why we selected the technology in the first place. I want to talk a little bit more about, uh, I'm, I want to be mindful of time. I think I got a little bit over ambitious with how much I want to talk about. I will give the, the high level of this. Iron air is not, we didn't invent iron air batteries. Iron air batteries actually been around since the 60s. So the first work was done by uh, uh, GTE under contract from NASA. I still don't understand why somebody thought it was a good idea to put a really heavy iron air battery in a satellite. Uh, uh, <laughs> But, uh, but nevertheless, that was the first work. Uh, there was a round of developing iron air batteries for vehicles, also uh, not a good idea. Um, in the 1970s and 1980s, there were three parallel efforts uh, in the US, in Germany, uh, and in Sweden around developing a couple hour duration, so five, one to five hour duration or one to seven hour duration iron air batteries for automotive traction applications. Uh, those got beat to market by valve regulated lead acid. And, uh, and some improvements to the internal combustion engine. And then it really sat around until the 2010s. And there was a, a project in Europe and an ARPA-E project in, um, in Southern California uh, that were looking at uh, one to two hour duration grid scale storage, so to compete with lithium ion. It turns out that round trip efficiency at short duration is not great. One of the trades we make with an iron air battery is extremely low chemical costs, and I give up round trip efficiency. Um, breathing air in and out, is hard, and it takes a lot of excess voltage to drive that reaction back and forth. And so the round trip efficiency is a trade-off we very intentionally make. That's hard to justify at short duration, but as we think about long duration things, uh, it's a different trade-off space. And so what I'm paying for, again, is reliability, not necessarily the highest amount of round trip efficiency. Um, and again, why iron air batteries are interesting for this application, but is not a silver bullet. This is not for everything. And uh, this is a slide that was you know, straight from the, the, this was late 2018. This was one of the very early uh, thick electrode test vehicles that we did with uh, iron air batteries. That's a, uh, that's five centimeter thick, which uh, relative to, to battery length scales, that's enormous. So a lithium ion battery will have an electrode that might be on the order of uh, hundreds of microns, 100 microns for very thick electrode. Um, and then a lead acid battery is maybe the closest with a, you know, maybe up to a centimeter electrode thicknesses. So um, these are uh, large macroscopic objects. And just the fact that we could make an electrode that was that thick uh, gave us a lot of excitement about the potential to do very large scale deployments of this. So 
Um, so we went to town, and this is sort of maybe more of the, this is the rendering, this is the picture of what is it that we're trying to make. We're trying to make what we think of as bi-directional power plants, things that are power plant scale to be paired with solar or wind. They can be located in different places, but connected on the transmission system, but to complement them. Um, not a battery for your car, not a battery for your home. Uh, there may be versions of that in the future, but this is the vision of what we're trying to develop. And this is something that we think is uh, consistent with the way that utilities do business today and that they can get their head around how to install this. Those are shipping container sized units uh, that are a modular building block, like a Lego block for building up a power plant in the field. And this is what we're after, 100 hours duration, a tenth the cost of lithium ion, and to use as many domestically available materials as we can uh, to deliver those kinds of power plants. And these are the building blocks behind that. So this is like a, uh, a, I think of it like a matryoshka, one of those Russian nesting dolls where there's multiple layers of building block that stack on top of each other. So if this is the power plant we ultimately want to make. Uh, we start all the way back here with a cell. So a cell for us is actually very large relative to other batteries. This is like the size of a window in your home. So it's a meter tall and 60 centimeters wide. Um, and that stores a lot of energy, but it's relatively low power. That's one way to think about what long duration means. We build those up into a battery module. And that's a used to be the size of a washing machine. We decided to make it twice as big. So it's the size of a washer-dryer combo, which doesn't really roll off the tongue in quite the same way. Um, and and that is, uh, that's the uh, smallest DC building block, direct current building block of an iron air battery. We put 10 of those inside of a, a shipping container, a modified shipping container. We call it an enclosure. And then that's what rolls out uh, to a fielded project site. There's other things that go around it. So uh, an inverter, how do we convert the direct current to alternating current so that we can connect to the grid? Uh, these things do require some, uh, they're like a fish tank. They require some care and uh, feeding. So uh, it's an air breathing system. We have to have fans and air handling, water management. You can lose water vapor uh, through that air phase. And so you have to replenish it with water. Uh, another reason why we're really focused on the utility scale application so that you can build all of that in. And that can be a turnkey solution for a utility. This is the basic cookie cutter building block then that builds up those power plants. So that's what, that's what we're developing very specifically. And, I'm going to talk a little bit more about how does iron air battery work beyond just saying it's reversible rusting. And so like any battery, we have two electrodes. We separate that chemical reaction of rust into a positive electrode and a negative electrode. And uh, what I have here is uh, an air electrode. That's my positive electrode for the battery. I have an aqueous liquid electrolyte. This is an alkaline electrolyte. So I have hydroxide ions or my working ions in the battery. Those are what shuttle back and forth. And I have an iron electrode. This is porous iron. Um, so what you see here are pellets of iron, but those can be pellets of any different length scale, but it's like a, a sponge of iron that's infiltrated with liquid electrolyte so that I can have access to the iron surfaces everywhere through the volume of that electrode. And what I'm doing is I'm breathing oxygen in on discharge through this air electrode. Oxygen comes in, it meets electrons, it's reduced, it turns into hydroxide ions. Those hydroxide ions migrate across the liquid electrolyte and react with iron to form first iron hydroxide, and then you can drive it to iron oxide. Um, that's the discharge process. That's how I turn rusting into an electricity generating operation as a battery. If I want to recharge the battery, I reverse that, and I drive a current uh, so that my iron hydroxide or iron oxide is now uh, reduced, and th that liberates hydroxide ions. Those diffuse back over or migrate back over to my air electrode where they are oxidized and turned back into oxygen gas. And so inside one of these batteries uh, actually looks like Alka-Seltzer. So you're evolving a whole bunch of oxygen bubbles vertically on that air cathode. Um, we actually do that on two separate air cathodes for the charge and discharge processes. Um, uh, but in detail is basically this construction of, of what the cell looks like. That's a little bit more detail on, on how it works. Um, one of the key things that we use is an iron material called direct reduced iron. And this is where some of the connectivity to the steel industry starts to show up. And so this is a material that is the lowest cost form of metallic iron produced on the planet today. Uh, it is principally made for steel making. It's an input to a route of steel making I'll talk a little bit more about called an electric arc furnace. And so this goes in uh, to an electric arc furnace. It's melted to make uh, new steel. Um, this stuff is made uh, by uh, reducing iron oxide, so iron ore, without melting it. That's why it's called direct reduced iron, is because I didn't melt it. I took it, and with a gas phase, I directly reduced it. One of the great properties of this stuff that has no relevance for the steel making industry, they don't care about it at all, uh, is it's porous. Uh, because I take iron oxide, and I drive off that oxygen chemically without melting it, 
I'm left behind with a porous skeleton of iron metal. And that's exactly what I want for my battery. Um, and the first time I saw this stuff, uh, I was visiting a lab in Minnesota that had a smorgasbord of different iron materials. So actually, 90% of the iron ore that's mined in the United States comes from the state of Minnesota. And, uh, and so uh, they have very, very proud, very deep roots in the iron mining and iron ore industry. And uh, they have uh, part of the University of Minnesota system. Uh, there is a research laboratory dedicated to iron processing. And uh, I was touring their lab, really trying to understand you know, how far back to the mine can we go, right? Everybody else has made iron ore batteries, works with this really high purity, really expensive stuff. Um, customized stuff that's used for uh, you know, metal 3D printing, basically, uh, is where it's finding application today. Um, I want to know, can we go all the way back to what comes out of the mine? And so we wanted to try and visit a mine. Turns out it was hard to get a, a permission to visit a mine, so we visited the, the lab instead, and they told us what goes on in the mines. Um, and they had a smorgasbord of all these different materials, and I just started picking stuff up, because I was rude and couldn't help myself. Um, and I picked it up, and I was like, what is this? And like, it's iron. And I was like, yeah, but the iron's like eight grams is cubic centimeter, this is, this is fluffy. And they're like, yeah, it's direct reduced iron, it's porous. And I was like, excuse me, what? <laughs> um, and so, uh, so we, we really latched onto this um, and have been running with it. And so um, this is the material we use. Uh, it's made at a massive scale globally. And so uh, today, as a planet, we make it all around the planet. We make 100 million tons of this. Um, and uh, it's actually a relatively new technology in the steelmaking industry. So this started in the 1970s. And actually, on the cost of chemistry plot, you'll have noticed iron air started back in 1965. That's when it's first reported. This material didn't exist in 1965, uh, which is one of the reasons why uh, we're able to make or access a lower cost of chemistry version of iron air than was previously accessible. And uh, so it's been rapidly scaling up. Uh, this actually still only represents about 5% of total uh, primary steel production today. So this is uh, not a dominant technology in the steel making space, but it's at scale. So steel is, steel is on a different scale than everything else. 5% of steel is still a lot more than almost anything else. And um, uh, this is made in massive plants. These are two plants that uh, exist in the United States. Uh, this one's in Louisiana. This one's in Ohio. Uh, these things are gargantuan facilities. These make 2 million metric tons of this stuff each. And so um, these are really marvels of modern chemical engineering um, and material science. Because um, what goes on inside of this is you put in uh, pellets. I'll show you pictures of the pellets. Or you saw the picture on the previous slide. They go in the top. Hot gas goes up uh, the center. They flow in opposite directions. Uh, the pellets work their way down uh, and come out at the bottom as reduced iron metal pellets. And um, then those get shipped off to electric arc furnaces where they get melted down and turned into steel. So we make this all around the planet. Um, principally today, this is made with natural gas. So the places where uh, this gets made, uh, this is my, my map of all the sites where DRI is made all around the world. And it's sized, the size of the bubble is the size of how much DRI do they make in that spot. Um, what you'll see is two things. One, all the places that it's made, there's low cost natural gas. Uh, and two, uh, there's access to water. Uh, because shipping iron, it's heavy, and it's expensive to ship iron, and you don't want to drive it on a truck. And so all of these sites are located where there is access to water and access to low cost reducing gas. Um, so uh, this is the kind of technology that actually has the potential to scale to the, to the size that we need. And so if you think about uh, back on the earlier slide, uh, there was a total global need of uh, you know, 4.7 terawatts. It's 400, if it's all 100 hour batteries, it's 470 terawatt hours. If I convert the amount of DRI that's made today, that's about 25 terawatt. So if I converted all of it, it's 25. So no matter what technology I'm talking about, something's got to scale. But this is at least in roughly the right ballpark. I'm talking about scaling this by maybe an order of magnitude, uh, something around that. Not scaling this by factors of uh, four, five, six orders of magnitude in order to meet the relevant global scale. So um, this is a lot about why we're excited about this material. So OK, that's all great. Lots of this stuff. It's really cheap. It's made all over the world. Does it work? <laughs> Um, and so that was a question we asked ourselves. And, and I, again, I'm, uh, this is not the latest and greatest, but this is um, the, uh, the, the data that uh, uh, very early on gave us uh, reason to believe that it could be made to work. And, um, and all, this, all this DRI out there, you know, hundreds of millions of metric tons, where to start? First thing, find a friend at one of these plants who's willing to send you a five-gallon bucket of it. Um, and you get that shipped to your site. Um, and then where do you start? Well, the answer is you start, uh, you grab a Dixie cup and a hose clamp, uh, and you test one of these things. And, and that's really where we started, was with single pellets building blocks. So those are 
uh, pellets that are about um, a centimeter or two in diameter. Actually, Isabella can probably tell you very, very accurately the size scale of these things. Um, and they weigh about two grams each. That's about all the more iron that is there. Um, but we started with single building blocks and testing lots and lots of these things. And uh, convinced ourselves that at a basic level, it could be made to work. And so uh, this is a measure of how much energy did I store, how much capacity per unit of iron. And this is a measure of uh, how much, how reversible could it be made to be. And so these are you know, just the very early scraps of data that convinces you, hey, there might actually be a there there with this stuff. And so um, from here, what we've done is to build up step by step. So if that was our cell, and this is a cleaned up, a nicer version. We made an improved version. We got away from the Dixie Cups into something a little bit more controlled. Um, uh, so that was a cell. That used two grams of iron in a single pellet. What's a cell today? Well, a cell today that we make is about 35 grams of iron and 18,000 of those pellets. And so um, that is the kind of scaling that we've gone through um, in terms of single cells that we're testing. And so these are um, individual full-scale cells. These are those things I told you were a meter high and the you know, size of a window pane from your house. Um, those are two that are on test uh, in our lab in California. And now we make uh, sort of dozens of those every week uh, for testing. And uh, those have each. And again, I, I kind of marvel at how much this is scaled up, because this is 2018 and this is 2023, and that's 18,000 of those pellets in every single one of those cells. And uh, um, so, uh, but we started from that single building block. And that's still, um, so, so we're still working on the scaling up. We've gone through about this really systematically. The first big volumetric thing that we made was in 2021. Um, just going from uh, single cell up to that module um, was another big step up of about 15x for us. Um, and. Uh, the reality is, though, like the technology enablers are all still down at that single pellet level. And so um, this is where uh, we have a, a continued focus on the material science of this. And uh, Chris Jacques is here. Chris works on this. I'm going to call you out because you're here. Since you showed up, I'll. Uh, uh, so uh, Chris is a DMSC course three alum. And uh, she works on our team at Form on these iron materials. Um, and uh, really, all I want to say about this is uh, there is a whole bunch that uh, we are still learning, that the DRI industry is learning about how to modify, control these microstructures. And that's what's critical to the performance of these batteries. It's got 18,000 pellets in it, sure. Um, but what really moves the needle on how does that battery perform is what's going on down here at the 10 single micron length scale. So how is that porosity distributed? Uh, what is the phase of the material inside of it? So these are examples of reduction studies that have nothing to do with batteries. And this is just an example of you know, microstructure. This stuff is really complex. This is, these are really hard and really fun problems to dig into of you know, what phases do I have? How are they distributed spatially? How can I control that as a function of the iron oxide that I put into the process, the reduction parameters? These are just like classic textbook material science problems that are required to move the needle on this uh, critical decarbonization challenge. And this is the kind of stuff that material scientists at Form do every day. And so um, when you think about what would a career in material science look like, um, you're working at this length scale, but to impact something like that uh, iron air battery power plant. Um, I'm going to pivot a little bit and talk about the, the, the manufacturing scale up. So there's kind of two steps. This is a question at lunch. It was a great question. How do you think about scale up? The first thing to think about scale up is I think about it in two distinct steps. There is physical scaling of the device, and then there's quantity scaling. So what we have done thus far really is focused on making bigger batteries, making the relevant size scale thing. Uh, now we got to make a lot of them. And if you want to go after terawatts, it's not by making a single terawatt thing. It is by making many uh, uh, highly controlled repeatable units. So um, that's one of the key things that's driven uh, solar and wind down their cost curves is standardization, manufacturing scaling. And so making lots of that same thing reproducibly with quality and then pushing really hard on driving down the cost of the equipment and the throughput of the processes. And so uh, now we're beginning to think about that. And we're doing that um, first in Weirton, West Virginia. And so uh, why Weirton? Uh, actually, move back up a step. That's a, uh, it is an old steel town. And so this is a picture from the 1960s of uh, that, that, that town. And uh, at its peak, uh, it was an integrated steel plant. They ran uh, four blast furnaces. And at its peak, they made 3 million metric tons of steel a year at that plant, and employed about 10,000 people. And uh, like much of the steel industry in the United States, this has been gutted. And so uh, today, it is uh, just a very small operation, just bits and pieces of what they formerly did. Um, but this is the site 
uh, that housed all of that. And I'm going to call your attention to this one building for, for, for uh, reference as a scale item uh, in, in the subsequent slides. So this is what it looked like in the 60s. Um, this is what that site looks like today. I actually was there yesterday. Um, so we had a, uh, we had a board meeting uh, down in the area, and we took a, a site visit. Um, this is a building. It's called the Open Hearth Building because it had an open hearth inside of it, uh, so a, a steel-making operation. Uh, that's a, uh, one of the few existing structures on that site that's not being used for operation. And uh, the rest of this, this is where those blast furnaces were. This is just a big field today. Um, and that's where we're going to plop our first uh, full-scale battery manufacturing facility. And so uh, there will be, on this site, 800,000 square feet of battery manufacturing facility. Uh, we're going to build it out in phases, so it's going to actually kind of get a first chunk and then a second chunk. And inside that facility, we expect to make, um, at, at full scale, once we've fully ramped it, 500 megawatts a year of 100-hour iron-air batteries. Uh, and it'll employ about 750 people uh, to do all of that. And uh, so what does 500 megawatts a year mean? Maybe you know, in the global picture, this is a small stab. Um, more tangibly, you know, that's on the order of you know, power, enough to, each year enough to power a small city. So enough to power something on the order of like 50,000 homes is a way to calibrate that. Um, so it's a significant impact, but it's a first step. Um, and we're really excited to do that in a, in a steel making town um, and to be able to leverage the capability of the capacity. I told you uh, the DRI is made in places where there's access to water. So one of the really critical site selection criteria is this river back here. And so um, this has uh, tremendous barge access. And um, this is really close to Pittsburgh. So this is in a, a part of West Virginia, the northern panhandle that sticks up north and south between Pennsylvania and Ohio. And so the same reasons that made Pittsburgh a steelmaking city are the same reasons that make Pittsburgh an attractive region in which to do iron air battery manufacturing, because these things are heavy, and you want to get them moved around very cheaply. Um, and so we're really excited to, to be there to take these first steps with manufacturing iron air batteries. This building is that open hearth building that I showed you and highlighted in the, the previous slide. So um, we intend to use that to repurpose it uh, to, to pay homage to the, to the work that was done there and to really link back to the past. Um, um, and, uh, and that'll be a, an integral part of our site in Weirton. Um, I'm going to talk, oh, I, yeah, my units of pellets. How many pellets go through this? So uh, there will be something like 10 to the 11 pellets a year moving through that facility. Um, and so. Uh, I'm still kind of boggled by that number. <laughs> um, uh, so um, I wanted to zoom out a little bit more and, and, and talk uh, about other ways in which, so we're going after this problem. But there's this adjacent problem, how to decarbonize iron and steel. And what are some of the ways that uh, the work that we're doing at Form connects into that broader ecosystem and we think, uh, frankly, can help to drive a flywheel of innovation um, and technology development um, that gives one shot on goal for uh, decarbonization of iron and steel making. And so uh, maybe again to calibrate the problem, I, I said uh, DRI today represents only about 5% of uh, uh, iron and steel making. Uh, we dig iron ore out of the ground. This is an example of an, uh, an ore site. We need to reduce that to iron and then to convert it into steel. Um, annually, we do about 2 billion tons of steel production. So uh, again, that 100 million metric tons a year of DRI is only about 5% of this. Uh, but that's a lot of stuff. So iron ore is uh, the second most highly mined material on the planet behind coal. Um, so that coal mining number is going to go down. This is quickly going to become the first. Uh, and so this is, a, this is a huge problem that has to be solved. It's like, how do we convert all that iron oxide to metal and then into useful high-tech steels uh, without emitting so much CO2? And so I want to talk a little bit about there's three basic processes that are used to make steel today. And uh, I apologize. I, I lifted this uh, picture from uh, World Steel. Uh, it's a great resource for facts, figures, technology, uh, information about how steel making works. Lots of detail in here. This is the least complicated version of the diagram of how steel gets made that I could find. And there's three basic processes. Um, they divide it into three steps, raw material preparation. So this is sort of your iron ore steps, iron making, and then steel making. So how do I first get iron, and then how do I add carbon to that to make it useful and, and convert it into something that's extremely strong, lightweight, and useful for all kinds of things. And uh, there's three basic processes, which I'll draw as vertical uh, columns on this. So there's a blast furnace process. So this is where I take iron ore and some form of carbon, usually a solid carbon, coking coal. I put those together, and I heat it up. I melt the iron while I reduce it, and I out comes molten iron. And so this doesn't make porous iron. This isn't super interesting for battery making. Um, but this is the most heavily practiced technology around the planet. About 65% of steel gets made this way. And uh, uh, this, is, this is the dominant technology by far for steel making. Um, the route uh, that uses DRI directly, where I take 
iron ore pellets. I feed those through my direct reduction process, and then I put them into an electric arc furnace. The electric arc furnace is where the steel making happens and where it does get melted. It can't accept iron oxide directly. That's why I have to do this reduction step. It needs metal, not oxide. And that only represents about 5% of global steel making capacity. The rest of it comes from recycling. So the electric arc furnace principally is fed by recycled steel. So this is actually a great technology. I take steel that's already metal. I turn it back into fresh steel. Um, this is a widely deployed technology. Um, and so then the real question is, well, can I take this route that goes through an electric arc furnace and uses DRI? Can this thing be made to scale? And how do I make this thing scale without driving up my carbon emissions? And so one first answer is, this is actually better than the, the blast furnace route, mostly by about a factor of two. So if I converted everything from blast furnace to direct reduction, and I use natural gas instead of coal, that gives you some incremental benefit. Um, but that doesn't really move the needle on decarbonization. And so what I want to do is figure out how can I turn iron oxide pellets into DRI uh, without using natural gas. And one possibility for that is hydrogen. Um, and so um, uh, that's one shot on coal, but it's going to be dependent on having uh, carbon-free green hydrogen available. Um, there's a number of technologies, a number of companies working on uh, ways to scale that up and to develop that. Um, and there's, like, there's real reason to have hope in that, but it's one shot on goal. And this has got to scale to a massive scale. Um, we hope that we might be able to provide a, a springboard, a, a, a starting stone, to nucleate some of this, and then further provide uh, some amplification of uh, the scale up of hydrogen. So uh, it's a complicated flywheel chart. I'm going to just talk about it <laughs> uh, going around. So uh, we talked about multi-day storage providing uh, firming of renewables, so to make renewables reliable and low cost. So I can have electricity that is carbon free and available all year round. If I can use that to then make green hydrogen, and by running my electrolyzers uh, all the time rather than just when the sun is shining, um, I have a shot at making lower cost green hydrogen. I can make that green hydrogen uh, go into a shaft furnace to make this direct reduced iron by re substituting natural gas with hydrogen, make that DRI. Then the DRI can go into our batteries. We, we like hydrogen-reduced DRI inside our batteries. It works just fine. Um, it could also go into green steel making. So we hope that, that there's a potential that if we uh, use green hydrogen uh, in our batteries, we make batteries that use that, uh, use that, put those under the grid, make lower cost hydrogen, have lower cost hydrogen to make more batteries with, have lower cost hydrogen to make more steel with. Um, and eventually, uh, this could get to the point where Hydrogen actually is low enough cost to make the economics of this make sense for steel making. And one shot on goal. Um, and what we're excited about this is also a lot of ways in which this is dependent on factors outside our control. And one thing I wanted to share with the group, especially the, the undergraduate students, this is a huge problem that needs a ton of material science innovation. And so we got to have other shots on goal. We need other material science and materials processing technologies um, to go after this. And this is also just one, one of the problems, right? There's all of these other things that got to get decarbonized, too. And a huge number of those are dependent on material science innovation. I mean, at, at a fundamental level, we need to really look at the way that we make all industrial materials today and think about how do you decarbonize every single one of them. This doesn't require a huge amount of focused, dedicated, creative effort um, from material scientists specifically to figure out how do I decarbonize every single one of these things. And so um, if I think about uh, what was a really important moment for me was uh, you know, I sort of came to batteries uh, because of the technology. I was like, I'm interested in like, these electric the ions moving around and doing reactions. That's cool. And um, when I was a first year graduate student, I went to a talk. Uh, it was given by Ellie Sachs, a professor in mechanical engineering who's done a lot of work on uh, solar manufacturing. And uh, you'll remember the cost curves I showed you about solar. And I, I was a first-year graduate student when we were still high on those cost curves. And Ellie was providing some projections and perspectives saying, we're going to get there. Like this, the solar is going to get cheap. And the thing that's going to limit solar is not solar. The thing that's going to limit solar is storage. And I was like, aha. This is, this is why I should work on batteries. And um, if I think about a pay it forward moment, uh, the thing I would say to especially the undergraduates is uh, 
don't work on batteries. Go figure out how to do these hard things. Like, we got to have another generation and uh, really focused on how do we go decarbonize all of these other materials and other processes. And if you're looking for a specific idea of one to work on, I'm happy to talk to you at the reception. I got lots of ideas, lots of problems. I don't necessarily have ideas of how to solve them, but I got lots of problems in mind uh, that are going to need solving. Um, and, uh, and I think that uh, it's a lot of fun. It's very exciting. Um, and it's essential to the future of our planet. And so uh, I challenge all of you uh, to, to find a way to make an impact uh, and to move the needle on these uh, really hard to decarbonize materials processes. So oh, uh, with that, I will uh, wrap. And thank you all for the time and attention today. Thank you so much, uh, Billy. That was. Uh Exciting, inspiring, and uh, and what a great uh, challenge at the end. Um, we'll take some questions in a minute. Um, I just want, oh, there's, okay. We have Professor Chang over there. Um, so it turns out in DMSC, we have a tradition that the Wolf Lecture receives a homemade gift. Uh, it also turns out that tradition is starting today. <laughs> uh, so, so you are the inaugural uh, DMSC gift, ah. and we wanted your former advisor uh, to be and co-founder uh, to be uh, the one to present it. Oh. So uh, here yes. you go. Billy, why don't you stand in front here? And I'll, uh, so uh, you know, we take uh, you know, mind and hand seriously. And so in uh, course three, uh, you, know, you, uh, you do the science and the engineering for me. Uh, world changing technologies, things like uh, that Billy talked about. But you know, in your spare time, you can also uh, do things such as work downstairs in the, in the metal shop with glass. Okay? Now, um, Billy is from Penn State. And when you give a, an honorary lecture at Penn State, uh, they give you a, a small version of the Nittany Lion. And so Billy, you know, he, he's given these lectures because the Nittany Lion. And so, what is the uh, you know, MIT book? It has to be better than the thing that. So, I will now show you, and uh, it will transport this safely for you. Okay, thank you. Oh my! <laughs> wow! <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And we'll make sure it, uh, it gets to where you yeah. want to go safely. Yeah, don't, don't drop it. It's not like one of your electrodes. It's not a big piece of iron, yeah. so it'll, it'll break. But I do want to mention that uh, this uh, was created by Meryl Bass, uh, who is a glass artist who also teaches uh, down in the glass lab. And so you know, if you work down in the glass lab in, in the uh, foundry, you get to work with all right. Thank you so much, Professor Cheng. Um, so uh, now that we've uh, started a new tradition, uh, questions for Billy. Oh, I should say also while I'm walking up with the mic, um, uh, we're going to have a reception. So like food and drinks and stuff uh, in the ch in the Chipman room. Am I right about that? Yeah, uh, right after. So please. Uh, if you're interested, join us there. Uh, who had it? Oh, yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, thanks so much for the great talk. So I was curious, you mentioned in your motivation, like storage over multiple months um, to go from the spring to kind of the summer season. I wonder, like, what's the limit of your batteries or what's the limit that you can imagine any battery? Yeah. So to be clear. Uh, we are not developing seasonal storage right now. So we're developing 100 hours. So what does 100 hour mean is maybe one question. That means I have a fuel tank that lasts 100 hours. So if I discharge my battery at full rated power, I have a one megawatt battery, I discharge at one megawatt, I have 100 hours of runtime until it's depleted. So how long I sort of sit between charge and discharge cycles is a separate access. Um, we think the use cases for our 100 hour batteries end up being about a dozen cycles a year. Um, only a couple of those are deep up and down, and many of them are shallow cycles. Um, the seasonal example was less about we're trying to solve, we're trying to shift this to that and flatten it out, and more to say the challenges of seasonality of renewables are not far off into the future things. They exist today. And so um, the argument that we don't need anything longer than four hours because 
that's a problem for 2050 um, is evidently uh, not true. So apologies if that was unclear. Uh, but we're really focused on that 100-hour battery. And then if somebody wants to discharge it more slowly, at a, say half a megawatt, you get 200 hours of runtime. So that's a limit um, that is uh, very flexible. Also, uh, that's true. And maybe I should have made this point more clearly. Any battery can be made to discharge at 100 hours. Like, I didn't take my cell phone battery and discharge it over 100 hours. The problem is, can I do that at $20 a kilowatt hour? And so that's the hard part, is making the battery cheap enough that you can afford to discharge slowly. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the great talk. I have a question. If you have thought about recycling those electrodes and how the cost compares to freshly made? Yeah, so we've thought about the recyclability of the product a lot. Um, and we really have thought about everything that goes into it, making sure that there are uh, components, uh, ingredients that uh, can be recycled. Um, we haven't actually done the analysis you're asking about of uh, looking very specifically of cost of recycling the electrode directly. We really thought about recycling the whole system. Um, and with respect to the iron material, um, there's a lot of ways in which that could be recycled, not necessarily going back into uh, uh, new electrodes, um, but also into just other applications. Um, so an example is like, it may well just be that you take the electrodes and you put them in an electric arc furnace, um, and you turn them into other higher grade steels. Um, so there's a number of different options. We haven't ruled anything out, um, but we haven't done the level of, of sort of detailed analysis. So as an example, like what we're trying to do is make sure you don't put stuff in there, like no lead in the battery. Like you gotta be able to recycle it, uh, meaning you gotta put stuff in it that is consistent with lots of optionality in the future for end of life. Yeah. Maybe just speak loud. I want to ask about what the fit is for your batteries. Is it air or is it pre purified air? Yes. If it's just air, doesn't your upper electrolyte get more acidic from the fuel carbonation? Yeah. Uh, I'll repeat the question repeat for the it, yeah. benefit of the recording. Yeah. So the question was uh, what do we feed the battery with? Uh, if it is just air or pure oxygen, um, and also a question about uh, CO2 poisoning. So since we use an alkaline electrolyte, uh, that can react with uh, CO2 in the air. So the answer is uh, we use CO2 scrub there. So we don't use pure oxygen. Uh, we do use air. Um, and part of the balance plant balance the system that I talked about is CO2 scrubbing. So for sure, the, that fundamental challenge is a fundamental challenge. Like the, uh, 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 there's nothing we can do about uh, the reactivity of a caustic solution with CO2. Uh, so we manage it. And it's like a perfect example of what I talked about, why the cost of chemistry has to be extremely low is got to pay for that. Um, maybe uh, there was there one up there. Yeah, go ahead up there and then here and then we'll we'll go eat and sure. keep talking. Yeah. I had a question about the interaction with traditional steel making. So, yeah. So like um, in traditional steel making, you use the basic oxygen components to decrease the carbon content. Yep. And make iron to make steel. Um, and in the in the mini mill, you sort of avoid that by using a large fraction of recycled steel. So in in you this uh, the DRI method. Yeah. How do you how do you that? How, how do you get carbon into uh, hydrogen produced DRI? From the, from the ore. Well, um, this is actually one of the, the detailed challenges of this. I'll just speak to it since uh, it's a good question. So in, the, the, in this DRI route, um, the existing natural gas DRI route, um, so you take iron oxide, doesn't have any carbon in it. Um, actually, since these processes happen with carbon-based reducing agents, they uptake some carbon. So uh, DRI, uh, industrially produced DRI today, commonly has two-ish weight percent carbon inside of it. So you are charging the electric arc furnace with some carbon to be able to make steel. That's one of the challenges that's got to get figured out for hydrogen-reduced DRI is how do you get carbon in, right? Because you don't just want to make pure iron metal. At the end of the day, you need steel, which it has to include carbon. So uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. I don't have an answer for how to do that. That is a problem that's got to get solved. Uh, I'm wondering how you maintain an electron transport when your uh, electrode is oxidized. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. I'll come at it a couple of different ways. I'm not going to give you the full answer to it, because this is, this is some of the, 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 the secret sauce. But um, what, one of the simple answers is um, we don't actually use it all. So the iron electrode uh, is so low cost, I don't have to re react 100% of it. And iron's a pretty good conductor. and so. Um, if I only react a surface layer, uh, there's some optimal amount that I can find where 
I react enough that I get the reactivity I need, but still maintain um, some convectivity through the volume of the electrode. So, yeah. um, so it's uh, different from lithium ion batteries. I got to use like every, okay, I put lithium cobalt oxide or you know, nickel manganese based uh, cathode actin material. I'm going to get every bit of utilization out of that as I possibly can because it's more expensive. In this case, it's cheap. So if I only use a third of it, a half of it, 60% of it, there's some number in there that's tolerable. Well, um, so uh, please uh, join us again. Join us for uh, food um, and more of Billy uh, in the in the Chipman room. Um, but let's uh, let's uh, thank Billy again for a fantastic uh, lecture. <laughs>